we're going to pick up after the Council of Jerusalem, the second missionary journey. And I'm hoping to get through the second missionary journey a day. The next week we'll cover the third and the last journey of the Apostle Paul. <clears throat> There's a fresh start. Sometime later, after that Jerusalem Council, Paul says to Barnabas, let's go back and visit the brothers at all the towns. Hey, let's, let's go see how all the other Christians are doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. Remember this guy? What is it about him? What do you remember about this guy? He went back. <laughs> yeah, he bailed. When things are starting to get a little tough, he got a little homesick. Oh, I want to go home. So, well, Paul, I got him on the dark side here, you know. <laughs> Paul did not think it wise to take it because he had deserted him. Not just going back. He was a deserter. Okay? No, no, man. If you're going to be on my team, you're all in. Barnabas, on the other hand, I mean, this is the guy whose name means the son of consolation. When nobody wanted anything to do with Paul, he stood up for Paul. Now Paul doesn't want anything to do with Mark. He stands up for Mark. He's the guy that always roots for the underdog. Anybody here like that? <laughs> you know, you, you, you're a lions. <laughs> <laughs> if you're a lions fan, you're you're there. <laughs> he, this guy, he's got a heart for the underdog. He's got a heart for the the person that's been hurting. Uh, he he sees he sees John and he sees potential. He sees potential. We just gotta get that potential out of him. Paul sees him deserter. Come on. You, you went with us and you bailed. I'm not, I'm not going down that road again. And so these two guys, you know, Paul and, and, and Barnabas, they had such a sharp disagreement that they part company. Whoa. You think that ever could happen to a church again? <laughs> have there been any churches that have ever had a split? Yeah, th this thing... It, it was in Bible times among godly people. You better believe it will exist and happen again in the 21st century. It won't be last time. Anybody ever heard of the Great Reformation and Martin Luther? <laughs> was that a major split? Yeah. I was one time going to do a funeral with a, a, a Greek Orthodox funeral, but the Greek Orthodox priest told me because of the great schism between the Roman Church and the Greek Orthodox Church that uh, we couldn't be on the same platform at the church together. Does anybody know when the Great Schism took place? <laughs> centuries ago! <laughs> it, was, it was centuries ago, and he still, oh no, we couldn't sit down. When we get to the gravesite, you can say a word. Okay, because we weren't into church. We got division, division, okay? And, and this division, okay, is going to lead to them taking two different ways. The results of the conflict. Got to remember, at the heart of this is a conflict. It results in assigning new partners. Barnabas took Mark, and he sails with him to Cyprus. They're going to go revisit the churches, right? Isn't that the way they... That's the old missionary route. They went to Cyprus, then from Cyprus, they went up into Asia Minor, and they hit all the cities. But Paul, Paul chose Silas, and he, and it says here, he chose him and, they, and commended by the brothers of grace to the Lord, uh, grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and then Cilicia to strengthen the churches. He's going in the opposite direction. One this way, one this way. And where are they going? They're going back to the old churches because the whole goal is to go strengthen all the brothers. But they must have had one pretty strong disagreement. Isn't that amazing? Right here in the book of Acts. I start with new helper, okay? So we have Paul and Silas now going on the northern route, and they come to Lystra. Lystra, and there's a disciple that was there by the name of Timothy. He lived, uh, uh, with his, and his mother was a Jewish and a believer, but his father was a Greek. So he's half Jewish, but she's a believer in Christ. She's one of those that they preached in the synagogue, accepted Christ, this is her son. She's married to a Gentile. And so because of this, and they're wanting to go to all the synagogues, he said, brothers in Lystra, Paul wanted him to take him on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area. He didn't want to give an offense to them. You don't have to be circumcised to be saved. 
but he knew that they were going to minister to him. If they heard that he had something, they would, they would turn him off. And so he you become all things to all men. By, by all means, you might win some. And so he circumcised. He was circumcised because of the Jews in that area, for they all know that his father was a Greek. And so he continues, and he joins the missionary journey. As they travel from town to town, they deliver their decision. What was the decision? The council. It's grace plus nothing. Salvation comes by faith in <coughs> Jesus Christ alone. That is the message. They're preaching that. They reached <coughs> the decision reached by the apostles at Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in their faith and they grew daily in number. Oh, I skipped this one. For the people to obey. And the things that they were to obey give none offense. Abstain from anything that would offend that other person. What are some things that we might abstain from today that might offend someone? Alcohol. Alcohol might offend somebody. Who might it offend? An alcoholic. An alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? I got saved from that. If you think you could, right? Okay. What else? What, what, what? Smoking. Smoking. What else? Me. Would offend a vegetarian. Meat, if you're a vegetarian, yes. What else? Language. Language. Do you ever hear somebody say, oh, that person can't be a Christian? Did you ever hear the mouth on that person? <laughs> See? There, there's all these things. Does that, if, if I were to curse, would that make me a non-Christian? No. no. No, I'm saved by what? Faith Very in Jesus Christ. Well, we would look at you. Too. You would really look at me. <laughs> <laughs> I might offend, and you would, yeah, you would say, what are you doing there? Okay. And so... We do obey God in a holy lifestyle, not to get saved. We do that because we are saved. Not to be part of the family of God. We're part of the family of God, so we act like the family of God. And that's what's going on here. So the churches were strengthened in their faith, and they grew daily in numbers. Folks, I really believe this with all my heart. Jesus will build His church. And when we yield to him the head of the church and we promote the great confession the great commandment to love God with all your heart love your neighbor as yourself which we do you know we love God we worship him here we love our neighbor we try to reach out to our community we, we try to clothe them we try to feed them we try to do all those things and the last piece though is the great commission all right we make disciples we invite people to join us we send missionaries out to tell those who haven't heard. When we do this, the church grows in numbers. The church will grow. All right, so what we have here, Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia. Here's Phrygia. It looks a little different on my computer, a little darker green. And Galatia. Anybody ever heard of the word Galatia before? Anybody heard of the book of Galatians? That's a whole region. When he writes the book to Galatians, all right, he's writing it to the churches in that region. What churches are in that region? These churches he visited on this first missionary journey. He's going on the second missionary journey. This is those churches he's writing to those churches. Having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in Asia, I don't know how God told him, but the Holy Spirit told him, don't go to Asia. I don't know why, all right? So we go on and it says, when they came to the border of Mysia, <coughs> Mysia is this section of Asia Minor. Here's Asia, it's a section there. Over here's Bithynia. They tried to enter Bithynia. He said, okay, I'm going to try to go to Bithynia. I'm going to take the gospel. Now, if he had gone this way, he would have probably gone back up and gone into what we now know as Russia. All right, the gospel would have went to Russia. They, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by the way of Mysia, okay, and went by Mysia, and they went down to Troas. So I got Troas listed there. I don't know if I got the name on it or not. Nope, they don't. Troas. So it was while they were at Troas, during the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia. That would have been a Greek. Remember Philip of Macedonia? He had a son by the name of Alexander the Great. Yeah, Alexander the Great. So, this is Macedonia. That section north Greece is down here. Macedonia is to the top. Okay. <clears throat> During he had this vision, and the Macedonian man says, "Come over to Macedonia, and help us." This was in a vision. So in that vision that night, he knows that God is speaking to him. 
So now he has a renewed mission. God has directed him where to go. After Paul had seen the vision, he says, we, notice that, we, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia. That God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From Troas, we. All of a sudden, the author of the book is including himself. Who's the author of the book of Acts? Luke. Luke. Or Luke. Yeah. Luke. All you do is read the beginning of the Gospel of Luke and the beginning of the book of Acts, the first two verses, they're identical. One is the, the volume one is the life of Christ. Volume two is the life of Christ through the apostles. Okay? And so Luke, Luke is a physician. He's a, he's a doctor. Paul, later in his epistles, he talks how he's been sick. It appears that Luke says, I'm a physician. I'm going to be your personal physician to travel with you through the missionary journeys. And so Luke comes on board of the team. So there's Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke now on this missionary team. The team is growing. All right? I think at some point our church will be, with its growth, we'll get to the point we need to consider taking on a second missionary internationally. We'll pick up another one. And as the church grows, we'll pick up another one. That's, what, that's the way it works. That's the way God is doing it. So Luke joins on the, the, the team here. And from Troas, that's where he, he gets on board at Troas. It says, we set out to sea and we sailed straight through the strait of uh, Samoro, Samoro, Samothrace. And the next day they went to Neapolis. So they dock at Neapolis. They get out at Neapolis. And from there they travel to Philippi. Let me go back. to They travel to Philippi. It was really close to Neapolis. It's a Roman colony. By that... Rome, obviously, is in Italy, but when a Roman soldier had served well, they would give him a grant of property. Well, most of the property in Italy was taken up. So they populated places like Philippi. Did you ever hear of a country by the name of Romania? The word Roman is in there because that's where they gave property to uh, soldiers who had served well, they were given property in Romania, and so most of the people in Romania were Italians. <laughs> they were Romans. Okay. And so anyway, this is a Roman colony. So you know that it's basically Gentile. He enters this leading city of that district of Macedonia, and we stayed there several days. He said, on the Sabbath day, we went outside the city gate and to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. Now this term, a place of prayer, if you didn't have ten families, ten families constituted a synagogue. You had to at least have ten families. So he's looking for a really small group. There's not enough Jews to have a synagogue, but they would have a place of prayer. So he goes out to find a place of prayer, and he says, We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there, and lo and behold, one of those listening was a woman named Lydia. She was a dealer in purple. This is a lady from one of our former churches. I just met her, saw her the other day at, at, at uh, Wendy's. <laughs> Be careful. I can take your picture and put your money on it. <laughs> yeah, so Lydia was seller of purple uh, from the city of Thyatira. Where's Thyatira? I want you to notice as we go through this, people are very transient in the ancient world. They move. They're very mobile. They move all over. It's kind of like today. Only not with a jet or you know or cars or anything, but they really get around. She was a worshiper of God. She was a God-fearing person. She's not a Christian because she does has been introduced to him. It says the Lord opened her heart. When Paul's preaching to her, she gets saved. There wasn't just one term for being saved. Becoming a follower, a person of the way, the Lord opened your heart. Uh, there's all these different terms, born again, but she accepts Christ. And the Lord opened her, her heart so she responds to the message, Paul's message. And when she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to stay in her home. She said, if you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she pers persuaded them. The gift of hospitality is a really strong gift given to Christians. We are to be hospitable, opening our homes to people. Peter goes on to say, 
Some have entered, have even entertained angels unaware. You invite somebody in your house, and it was really actually an angel from God. At least in Bible times that happened. I can show you places in the Old Testament. <clears throat> There's a new opposition, though. Once we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She's probably demon possessed. Okay. And uh, her making fun, making money off this operation, go to this, pay the money, she tell you your future. This girl followed Paul and the rest of us shouting. She's shouting. These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way, <clears throat> the way to be saved. Oh, this sounds pretty good. This sounds right. You know, even when the demons came to Jesus, he said, since you are the Son of God, do not, you know, cast us out. Don't, don't, just... The, 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 the condition there is six. They knew who he was. They know what's going on here. The demons know. And this girl is shouting this. She kept us up for many days. Now, this got a little annoying to the apostle Paul. <laughs> okay? Finally, Paul came, became so troubled that he turned around and said to her, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you, come out of here. And at that moment... The spirit left her. She had been demon possessed. Possessed of, 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 a, of a spirit. Now, the, the, if I back up if I back up a slide, the Greek text does not have the word the here. Which changes everything. These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you a way of salvation. A way to be saved. Is there a difference between a way and the way? Huge. Huge. One could be a way of many ways. The way. The only way. And so it could be, you know, uh, because it's either with the article or without it. They don't have an indefinite article in Greek like we do. So that could be very well the tip off that she was not really saying the way. But she was just saying a way. Is why Paul Paul was able to do that. Okay, let me see. I can right here. Yeah. When the owners of the slave girl realized that their hope of making money was gone, well, this, the, the demon's gone. She can't do this anymore. Oh boy, big trouble. They seized Paul and Silas, dragged them into the marketplace to face authorities. And they said, "These," he said, "these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating unlawful customs for us uh, Romans uh, to practice." And uh, with that, they throw him into jail. You're going to find that from now on, it seems like every time Paul goes into a town, he winds up in jail. <laughs> Did I ever tell you it's going to be tough to be a Christian? You know, the whole, whole gospel thing that, hey, God loves you and has a, beautiful, a wonderful plan for your life. Well, that wonderful plan may be in jail. Okay? <laughs> it was for the Apostle Paul. They were thrown into jail. It says uh, they were attacked. Uh, they had been severely flogged. They were thrown into prison. The jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in inner cell, fastened their feet in stocks. He said, they told me to watch them carefully. They're not getting away from me. <laughs> yes? Well, how did Luke avoid being put in prison with, with the Paul and Silas? That's a good question. You'll have to ask the Lord someday. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't tell me the answer to that. Yeah, and Timothy, he's not in there either. Yeah. So, and... and, and you know, the accounts don't always tell us when the other ones go other places. You know, they could have gone down to McDonald's to get some burgers when all this happened. I don't know. So, anyway, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying. You think they were praying out loud? Sure. I think they were praying out loud. Praying out loud. And singing hymns. You think they were just singing, make a melody in their heart? I think they were pretty loud. They're singing hymns. Now, what? What? here you are. You've been beaten, you're flogged, you're in prison. Your legs are in stocks, and you're praying and singing. There's something wrong with this picture, isn't there? I think we'd be complaining. So suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake. I don't know if I got that highlighted. Yeah, I do. Such an earthquake that the foundation of the prisons were shaken at once. The prison doors flew open, and <coughs> chains came loose. They're all free. Now, he's been, he's been told, make sure these guys don't get away. <laughs> all right? Here's the new opportunity. We got a new opportunity. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors were open, he drew out his sword and was about 
to kill himself. Anybody know why he was going to do this? He would have been killed, killed, killed anyway. for letting them all go. Yeah. Yes. In the Roman law, if you're a guard, your prisoner gets away, it's your life for the one you let go. So he knows he's a doomed man. The doors are open, they've been freed. He takes the sword out, props it on the ground, ready to thrust it through himself. That was the way they would do that. Uh, if, if they didn't have somebody to do it, like push it right down through my neck type thing. He says uh, he was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. This is my, uh, my, this is my nephew. I, I use anybody. <laughs> this is at, at uh, North, the North Ridge uh, Church's uh, Christ, uh, the Easter program. I took that picture. Got that picture. <laughs> so uh, I use anybody. All right. He says, but Paul shouted to him, don't harm yourself. We're all here. The jailer called the light, he rushed in, fell trembling before Paul and Silas, and then he brought them out, and he asked them, here it is, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? How would he ask that question? What must I do to be saved? Do you think it had anything to do with the psalms they were singing? Do you think they were singing some of the songs of salvation from the book of psalms? I do. I think it's, this is the word connecting the dots, okay? They, he heard them singing. He heard them praying. You think maybe they were praying for people to be saved? You think maybe they were, you think people, they were praying, well, I pray for Aunt Martha's ingrown toenail that she'll get well. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't mean to mock. We're supposed to pray so that we have help. I think they were praying about the churches, about lost people, about opposition. They are praying about the people who incarcerated them. They may have been praying for that jailer. They may have been praying for the jailer. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Here's the famous verse, Acts 16, 31. They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Now, the Greek text for the word in there, because we don't use this much in English, is the, literally the word upon. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. If I were to set a chair up over here and say, I believe that, <coughs> that chair will hold me up. Is the chair holding me up? But if I say, I believe upon, and I actually sit upon it, then is the chair holding me up? That's the difference. What he's saying here is, you make the commitment to Jesus Christ. It's not just all my head. It's not just in my heart I get this ushy-gushy feeling. I am actually putting my confidence and trust in Jesus Christ alone, believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will. That is a fact. The reason I know that I'm saved is because I have believed. I have no other reason than God. Listen, God said it. Jesus did it. I believe it. That settles it. Didn't I agree? That's how it works. He says, you and your household, because we're going to see the household later believes too. He's not saying that if I get saved, everybody in my family does, because that would contradict other places in Scripture. But he's saying this message that is not is true, not just for you as the head of the house, it's uh, true for everybody in your household. Your household would even include if you had slaves. If they will believe, they will be saved too. It all comes out here. All right? They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all that were in his house. See, they went out and preached to him. And then after that, in that very hour of the night, the jailer took them all out and they washed them their wounds immediately. He and all of his family were baptized. You're going to find in the book of, the, 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 the book of Acts, the order is always... You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and then you get baptized. It is never the reverse. There are no infant baptisms in the book of Acts either. None. Zero. Zilch. There's not a place in the Bible where an infant gets baptized. There is no sprinkling or pouring. The words sprinkling and pour are used in the Bible for a lot of things, but they're never used for baptism. All right? In the book of Hebrews, the high priest, it says, he went into the holy place with blood and he sprinkled it on the lid of the altar of, of the Ark of the Covenant. So that we have the word sprinkle used there. The word sprinkle, but it's never used for baptism. The word pour is used seven times in Revelation 16, where God pours out his wrath on the earth. It's a figure of speech. But it's never used for baptism. Go ahead. I have a question. Was Paul's vision and the new opportunity, weren't the 12 disciples preaching that Christ died, was buried, and rose again? And Paul's vision was, he added to that gospel for your sins. 
they weren't preaching for your sins. They were preaching he was, he died, was buried, and resurrected. But Paul's vision, I believe, was in Corinthians that he added into that, that he died for your sins. Yeah, I think that was always the case, that they were, it, it's kind of like uh, in the Bible, there, they were baptized in the name of Jesus, okay? Well, that doesn't mean it wasn't in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay? Name of Jesus meant it was Christian, which Jesus said was Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, when it says Ark of the Covenant of the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant of God, sometimes it's called the Ark of God, sometimes it's called the Ark of the Covenant. When he talks about <clears throat> that you believe, 1 Corinthians 15, when the, the Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, he was buried and he rose again the third day when he rose again. You know, for, uh, for our sins. For our sins has always been the case that Christ died as a substitute for our sins. It goes all the way back to the atonement. Okay, It was a covering for sin, but Jesus took away our sin. Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. This whole idea of taking away the sin has been central all the way through. It's just magnified more in some places than others. That's the way I would take it. But all that started after Christ died before he died. He hadn't died for your sins yet. So right, before that was a repent. Believe in Christ. Right. But after he died, it was believe Christ died for your sins. Yes. So even So much so that when we get to Acts chapter 19, which I don't think we're getting to today. Uh, and Acts chapter 19, which will be next time we'll look, you will see that those who have been baptized by John just for repentance, they needed to be rebaptized. Okay. Because they're missing the opportunity. The new What's that? One. The new opportunity? What, what was the new opportunity? Well, I don't have my notes. What was the heading before that? They have a new opportunity here of sharing the gospel with this Philippian jailer. Okay? Does that help you? The new opportunity of... Sharing the gospel. With the, even though they're in jail, they have an opportunity. That's what I'm calling it. They have an opportunity while they're in jail still to pre present the gospel. They're, we, we, it doesn't matter where you're at. If you get sick and you go to the hospital, you have an opportunity in the hospital to share the gospel with who's ever there. You know, if you get incarcerated, you've got an opportunity in prison to share the gospel. If you're, I don't care where you're going to school, you got an opportunity to share the gospel there. The new opportunity here for them was while they are incarcerated still to share the gospel. Okay? And I think in Romans and Corinthians, Paul says he's preaching my gospel, Paul's gospel, because he had a vision that there's a transition from you're not saved by works but grace and then the disciples were teaching death, burial, and resurrection but Paul added into that gospel for your sins yeah but I think that was always the case even Peter has that as you know, that he died the just for the unjust to bring us to God being put to death in the flesh and quickened by the spirit in First Peter has for your sins been a theme throughout the Bible? Yeah. It has been. Yeah, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to our own way. And he the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all, our sins. So that was the theme even in Isaiah. Isaiah 53. So, I mean, there's verses all the way through that he is the one who's going to save us from our sins. The just shall live by faith is the whole theme there. Yeah. All right. I'm not sure if I answered that, but we can talk more about it afterward. And baptism isn't save you from your sins. Not at all. No. Don't no, baptism does not save you from your sins. All right. Let me keep going. The jailer brought them to his house, and he set meat before them. They were all filled with joy, and because he had become, he had come to believe in God, he and his whole family, and so they had accepted the <coughs> Lord here as God. And uh, so when the daylight came, the magistrates wanted to release them. He said, "You can go in peace." But Paul said to the officers. They beat us publicly without a trial, even though we were Roman citizens and threw us into prison, and now they want us to get, get rid of us quietly? No, let them come and release them and escort us out of town. He was now saying, no, 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 no. We're Roman citizens, and we have Roman citizen rights. And so he is using even the political system. We as Americans, we have American rights, and we need to assert our rights when it's to the advancement of the gospel righteousness and justice, okay? All right, the officers responded. Oh, well, we didn't know they were Roman citizens. They came and escorted them out after this Paul and Silas uh, came out of prison. 
Uh, they went to Lydia's house where they met with the brothers and encouraged them, and then they left. Food for thought. If you were a missionary, if you were on a missionary journey like Paul, where would you like to go? The Bahamas. The Bahamas. <laughs> hey, wait a second. Time out. Diane, have we done that? Yeah, we did. We did a mission. Oh, yeah, Sue. Yeah. We did a missionary trip to the Bahamas. All right. Where? My, my uh, hometown, China. Oh, hometown. Awesome. Where else? That's China. Calvary. Pardon? Calvary. Calgary? Calgary. 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 Okay, yeah. Where else? I want to hear. I want to, where would you like to go? The depths of Africa. Israel. The depths of Africa. All right. Where else? Not very adventurous. Nobody wants to go anywhere? Somebody said Israel. I'd like to go. Israel? Israel. Anybody say like Detroit? Yeah. <laughs> is Detroit a mission field? Yeah. That it is. Muskegon? Yeah. Waterford? Waterford? Yeah, yeah, okay. All right, now I said that. Paul didn't get to choose, remember? He liked Bithynia, but God forbade him. He liked Asia, God forbade him. Where do you think God would send you? Hmm? He wouldn't want to go. And to my family. Yeah. Ooh, okay. Workplace. So, workplace. Where else? Your community. Yeah. In your church. In our church. <laughs> yeah. Bethany here. Bethany, yeah. <laughs> what do you think prompted the jailer to get saved? I already answered that. I think they were singing and all that. Okay. What are you learning about missions so far? No matter where you go, you share the gospel. Everybody hear that? Yeah. No matter where you go, you share the gospel. That's really the heart of it, isn't it? Mm -hmm. We're all missionaries. We are all missionaries. All of us. I love the goods. And I love that, you know, they they gave up the cushy life of America, you know, to go have to go through language <laughs> and all of that. But they're not they're not made of any better stuff than the rest of us. They don't have any higher calling than the rest of us. We are all called to be a minister to someone, to love my neighbor as myself. If I really love my neighbor as myself and I'm saved, I want them saved, don't I? So somehow, through my actions and my word, I need to bring them to know Jesus. And the path could be a lot of different ways. It might just be simply inviting them to church or inviting them to listen to a Bible study. Go to a Bible study with you. It, it might be, you know, opening up your Bible and doing a one-on-one -on -one with them. It might be simply giving them a gospel track. Go ahead. What about our friend who, uh, her cleaning lady, is a believer. And whenever she cleans, she talks to her about it. And... She does. Yeah. And, and our friend, I don't know, there's really a, there's a Christian might think that they are because they go to church, but I'm not sure that they really know Jesus. But talks about this cleaning person constantly sharing her faith. Mm -hmm. Cleans her house. Mm -hmm. What were you going to say? I don't think sometimes it's, you know, you see where we should let God go. And, and I think I think we go, what do you mean me? I go through this checklist. Okay, so he'll say, we well, go here. You know, I'm not real comfortable about that. What else you have to offer me? Well, I'd like for you to go here. Find something that I am more comfortable in doing. You know, I mean, I go through this, this checklist and it's like, not necessarily what God wants to, but what zone am I comfortable in yeah. doing? And I think until we can step out of that comfortable zone. Yeah, let, let, let God lead us. Let God direct us. It doesn't mean it will be comfortable. Does it? And if things are uncomfortable, doesn't mean I'm not where God wants me. It's pretty powerful stuff. I think I'm only halfway through this journey. My final thought here, though, the gospel is never intended to be kept to myself. Is that important? All right. The second missionary journey so far. It's a long one. We're going to stop here. Let's see our time. We're going to finish the journey next week, and we'll at least get through the third journey.
and we don't know that we'll get through this fourth journey. So, um, well, I don't. I, I find this stuff exciting. This, this is the the, the Bible is exciting. We are living in exciting times too. All right, and I have great expectation of what God is going to do now. To be a missionary, listen, I talked about last time, prayer outreach. And I gave out a sheet like this. Pray. It says, called pray to come, outreach. And what you do is you go to your neighborhood, you find a street, you jot down the address, and you pray for that house. Oh, Lord, my heart's desire and prayer is this house, this home, is that they might come to faith in Jesus and our church. You pray something like that. You list it. <clears throat> you bring your list back to us. You got to do this within the next three weeks. You fill that out. You bring it back. You keep praying for it. We're going to put this. We're going to make up cards. We have a <coughs> sample card right here. He took our place, but why? That's the theme for our Easter. He took our place, but why? On the inside is a little write-up to all of them that we've already done at Christmas. We're sending a postcard. It says the same thing. He took our place, but why? Same write-up on the outside. Those that we put on our list, we're going to give you a stack of these. You just write a little personal note inside to invite that person to come on Easter Sunday morning, April 1st. We're going to then compile all these. We'll, have, we'll bless them, and then, then we'll, we're going to mail them all out so that people are invited to come on one of the two highest attended Sundays of the year. If they're going to come at any time. It would be Christmas or Easter. We're going to do it again. If everybody were to fill out one of those... <coughs> And we would then be able to mail those out to once before. I really believe that God is going to work in drawing new people into our church. That we might grow. That we might grow. Just like they did in the book of Acts. All right? If you didn't get one last week, I'm going to set them um, right here. And the name is not required. The name is not required. The name is only if... Uh, you notice it on the mailbox, like the Johnson family, or you know, you see sometimes the name is on it. You can jot that down. That way we can make it a little more personal. That's all that is about. Okay? <clears throat> Our time is pretty well gone. Um, so let's go ahead and pray uh, God's blessing on our departure. Father in heaven, we're so very thankful that you've given us the word of God, the, the book of Acts, uh, the life of Christ, that we can be followers of Jesus. We want to be missionaries too, and we want this prayer outreach, uh, Lord, to be blessed by you. And so we ask you even now that you would prepare us for the streets that we will pray over, and Lord, that we will invite to come to, to church on Easter Sunday. And Father, we pray for our missionary, the goods, who are serving in our capacity in Hungary. Lord, there's so many other missionaries that have been sent forth. Bless them on this Lord's Day. Uh, some still have services today to, to have. May the word of God go forth with power and authority. Uh, bless Bethany, Lord. May we be a Jesus-built church, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.